You're listening to Off to Market with Scott Farley and Hamish Chadwick. I'm Scott. And I'm Hamish. And this week we've got Paul back again because we're going to be talking about a very important subject matter for all entrepreneurs and any business owner, which is cybersecurity. Paul trained at Harvard University and is a certified cybersecurity risk advisor. Paul was also director and president at the board of COSBOA, which is the Council of Small Business of Australia, and is the architect of COSBOA's cybersecurity program for small business. He has been heavily involved in cybersecurity and has contributed to the Prime Minister's Roundtable on Cybersecurity. So, Paul, first question is what are the biggest threats in 2019 for business when it comes to cybersecurity? Thank you, Hamish. A good question. It does change every year. And the thing about cybersecurity is it's evolving over time and it's evolving because the amount of money that's involved at the criminal end for cybersecurity. You might be horrified to hear that in this year we something like $3.4 billion and by 2023, $1.4 trillion goes worldwide to fund cybersecurity. That is money that they take out of our system. So it's a growth business. It's not going to go away. It's not a 13 year old boy in his uh, room three o'clock in the morning trying to scam you. It's organised crime. And more importantly, these days, it's organised crime who partnered up with government or individuals in governments in uh, countries overseas. They are looking to steal your money. So that's the first thing to consider. What are the three things this year? Uh, The first thing is uh, spear, spear phishing. You may have heard of phishing and that's where you get the email and it's like the ANZ bank, we need to put your details in or or a DHL, you've got a parcel, you need to register, click the link, any of those clicking the link emails, they're just broadcast to maybe a million, two million people at a time. Spear phishing is where it's particularly targeted to you, which means that the cyber criminals will look at your LinkedIn profile or your social media, your Facebook page and all the rest of it to understand who you are, who your friends are. And then they attack you, not necessarily to to um, get to you, but they're looking at to see who your contacts are and how they can get to those contacts. So spear phishing is the number one threat for SMEs in 2019. Um, The second threat, and this is for businesses and really appropriate for startups, you can nip this one in the bud if you think cybersecurity moving forward. It's third party compromises. Third, one of the uh, um, exercises we did in my Harvard training was on the target. Target uh, had a hack in 2017 And basically, the cyber criminals got away with uh, 43 uh, million credit card details. And the way they did that was they had a air conditioning contractor who looked after the air conditioning of all their stores um, in the United States. And they got in through a breach in that air conditioning contractor into the target stores. And there was a breakdown then in corporate processes, etc., and enable them to do it. So it's just as important when you're thinking about cybersecurity, thinking about people you buy things from as as to what is their cybersecurity position. You need to ask that question. How is their business secured? Because if you don't know what how their business is secured, they can get into yours. The third threat this, this year is uh, crypto mining. That's a really big subject, and I could talk for hours on that. And it actually takes took me a long time to understand it myself because it involves the what's called the blockchain and Bitcoin and how that all goes into mining. But suffice it to say that crypto mining is the mining of uh, Bitcoin by solving an algorithm on computers. And the quicker you solve it, the more bit, bitcoins that you can earn, and you can convert that to, to real money. So there are factories in or mining operations in other places. I have a video of one in China 
where there's probably about 2,000 computers all hooked up together, all screaming um, and working 24 hours a day, seven days a week to solve these algorithms. It uses a lot of power. In the video I have one mining center uses about $80,000 a month, US dollars a month in power. As the amount of bitcoins gets taken up, the algorithms get harder so they need more power to work a lot quicker and what's happened is the Bitcoin value has gone down so to keep their value up they need to get more power so what they can do is using a spear phishing campaign to get into your system into your router and then get your router number most routers are unprotected and that's a tip for you if you if you have a router on your private network, let's say you've got a small business working from home, make sure you change the default password. If you don't do that, anyone can come in if the pass means admin or in, in my office we have a Telstra modem um, and that's uh, admin Telstra and it stays as a default password unless you change it. So make sure you change it. But they can get into your system and from there they can go into your system that get the password to get into your website the back end of your website on the back end of the website they can put um, about a line of code in there uh, which is probably 15 characters let's say and that means that everybody that visits your website will then get infect infected and what they're looking to steal from you is energy so what you you could notice is your computer going a bit slower turning on by itself when you've got it turned off um, and what's happening is they're sucking out energy to fuel these these large mines and if it's a lot of it is done it can damage your computer or you just don't know your energy bill will go up by ten dollars well ten dollars multiplied by you know 20 million people is enough to fund their their mining activities so that's the third thing can in conjunction so that's crypto mining or crypto hacking as it's called and the, and the um, in conjunction with that we still look seeing a lot of ransomware and ransomware usually comes from phishing emails opening an email that you shouldn't they're getting very very sophisticated especially with spear phishing that we talked about before where they're designing an email that looks to you as a as a legitimate source from someone that you knew so they're the three main things that that you really look should be protecting against uh, in 2019 no doubt in 2020 things will change but that's 2019 so no, that, i'm sorry no i was going to say i was uh, just to bump in there sorry scott uh, is Paul, uh, you and I have spoken a lot about cybersecurity. I've learned an awful lot from you about it as a subject. It's a very broad subject, but one of the difficulties I think, and this is important for all our listeners to understand, is, is that as a prospect to sell the idea of cybersecurity, it's a bit like telling people that the sky is falling in. You know, a lot of people will learn about this. You've just spoken about it, but it's, it's often a very hard sell to, to say to people, look, you know, the threat is real. It could happen to anyone at any time. Uh, people just don't seem to be as concerned yet until it affects them uh, personally or it affects their business. It might be an idea. Can you give us some real world examples of what has actually happened? I mean, you've dealt with businesses that have been attacked. Can you give us some real world, ex world examples of small businesses that have been targeted and what has been the, the impact of that? I can give you one from uh, last week. I have an accountant who gives me um, a lot of clients to sell their business and value their business and uh, when I was visiting with her just last week she told me there there was a firm in a multi-story building above immediately above them which had a business there that was valuing uh, residential properties they had six values working out from there well they got attacked by a ransomware virus and they lost all of their computer information didn't pay the ransom bill and their business were was uh, she said was shutting down in the in the following week so it's not something where it's not like you can be a little bit hurt you know you can be a lot hurt and it can wipe you out if you're a small or medium business um, 
and that came from probably a spear fishing campaign where they got into the to the system through a someone opening an email that they shouldn't have opened. So that's the first instance. Another instance was a referral from a solicitor here in Brisbane who had a mate down in Sydney, ran a company down there, 23 employees, rang me up frantically on a Sunday afternoon to say, I think one of my staff left a USB drive with all their passwords on a bus or something and someone's picked it up and they've got all the passwords and they got into our payroll system and what through, through using the, the, the password and got into the uh, payroll system and they changed the delivery address of all of the of all of the people's wages in there so that when the payroll rolled over at the start of the month instead of the money going into the people's bank accounts it went straight into their Australian bank account because they're not stupid they know it would be flagged if it was a overseas one and from there it goes out to them in that instance they're a little bit lucky because the CFO's uh, name uh, started surname started with the B and so it rolled over the payroll in alphabetical order so when it got to him he got a he got a note from the bank saying you've changed your banking details you know and he said no we haven't and they picked it up and were able to stop it how they got into the system in the first instance wasn't somebody who who left a uh, USB on a bus um, you'd be surprised to notice that there are to note that there are about 1.5 billion usernames and passwords usernames being usually the email address and passwords on the dark web for sale at any one time and cyber criminals buy these in a million at a time and then they methodically go through them trying to exploit those and extract money to get to one trillion dollars in sales has got to come from somewhere that's 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 how it happens so you have to protect your passwords you have to have good passwords if you don't they're going to be exploited when you talk about protecting your password though what does that mean i mean how are cyber criminals able to get a hold of these usernames and passwords to start with i mean can't we just i mean if i've got a virus software if i've got an it consultant that i work with I mean, isn't that enough? Isn't that enough of a barrier? I mean, how do criminals get a hold of these credentials? Well, regrettably, that really is outside of your, your control. There are large companies that have data leaks on a regular basis. Um, Avantia Cybersecurity has a weekly blog that we put out which lists uh, data breaches all around the world from big companies. There's not a company that you could name that I would uh, as I write the blog, would be able to tell you that company has never been breached. They've all been breached. And when they get breached, it could be 150 million. Let me give you an example. Booking.com, where I do all my travel bookings from, they were breached last year, and it was something like 300 million usernames and passwords that were stolen and appeared on the dark web for sale. That's where they come from. You can't have no control over doing that. Your IT person... Um, let me just say first off that IT is not cyber security. Cyber security is uh, IT is fixing things and internal systems and the tools you need to be able to fight cyber security, but cyber security is a lot, lot more than that. So having a strong password management program is really important. Having a strong firewall is not important if they have your password. They can just walk straight in. Anywhere you can go, they can go. When you think about it these days, I know I have 84 logins. You probably think you haven't got that many. But, you know, if you have to log in to, to get information from Bunnings. Anyone, anyone who's doing the research has got hundreds. You've, you've got oh, hundreds, hundreds. And people can't remember what the, the names are. So using the same password is very common and very dangerous. But a lot of people will do something a little bit different. They'll, they'll um, put a, an asterisk on the end of something and not on another. And, but it will have the root. The root of that password will be the same in, in all of their um, logins. So um, that's a real issue. So how, how do you, because that's exactly me, you know, because I can't remember a thousand different passwords. But how, how do you generate, is that something you can share? How you can generate a good, powerful password? It sounds like it's a bit of a key uh, issue. 
It is, um, and I'll tell you that a password really should be, um, these days, a minimum of, of 12 characters. When you think about it, uh, and you think about the QWERTY key keyboard, there are only so many letters and so many symbols and so many capitals that you can use. So there's not an infinite number of um, possibilities there. Um, so you can put a stronger password which may stop them getting in. But if it gets stolen because, um, you know, Bunnings got hacked or uh, Page Up was another one in Australia last year, I think or the year before, uh, Page Up was a recruitment agency. If you wanted to apply for a government job or to Qantas or one of these, you had to put your resume in. If you had to put your resume in, you had to have a username and password to be able to log in. Well, they, they got, all got stolen. There's another opportunity. How do you stop that? You can't do anything about that. All you can do, and we, we um, partner with an American company that uh, looks, constantly looks at the um, dark web 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And our clients um, who we've registered their username and password uh, on our system and on the back end of their system, if that name crops up, uh, we let them know and they have to change their password uh, immediately. You've got about 11 days as a, min as a minimum before it, it can be exploited. But if you've got 100 hundred sites that you go and reference and you change one, change the password for each one, it's a, it's a big effort, isn't it? It is, but that's the only way to, to do it. And quite often there are ways of getting around that by putting a number in front of your password. And if you know that number relates to that particular login that you're using, then when it comes up on the alert that we will send to you, you'll be able to recognise that's the one I've got to change. So there are systems like that, we, we can help with that. And that is surprisingly une unexpensive to monitor all those passwords. If you've got 10 passwords, it's uh, $60 a month and it goes up from there. But that gives you security so you know that nobody's going to get your passwords and, and uh, be able to ex exploit them by just buying them on the dark web. So you need to have strong passwords, you need to have them monitored. It doesn't matter about anything else if you don't have those two things covered because it's like the key to the front door of your house. It doesn't matter how big the, the walls are and how strong the lock is, if someone's got the key, they're straight in there. Yeah. So that's the first thing. What about um, like bringing it back to startups and inventors? They might have their their um, valuable information about their patents and their product and their you know CAD drawings and all the rest of it. Uh, how often do you see that sort of stuff being used um, or, or stolen? Is it valuable enough to, to worry about? Well there are, uh, it is valuable enough to be looked at and it depends what it is they're inventing. There are governments worldwide that have apartments. I won't, I won't mention one particular government but you probably know who I'm talking about, and I love Chinese food. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> Amy's just looking horrified now. But they have they have, password, quick smart. <laughs> they, they have hundreds and thousands of people in their employ who look who who look for industrial espionage to find out those sorts of things. Hmm. And you know, every big company starts off as a small company, so it's just gathering intelligence every country does it including our own mm. okay. so and you know the same thing the same sort of protection you need just to make sure you need the you've same protection, protection if you're you hide the key basically you got to hide the key and 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 basically you've got to monitor to make sure that people don't can't access that key okay so well, that's, that's really, really important good. and quite inexpensive okay. the second thing you need to do is that you need to have you need to protect in cyber security the operational risk of your business, that includes things like the passwords, like using a VPN, virtual private network, for externally when you go out of your office. Change the password on your router. They're the operational. The other thing is the legal risk. Every government around the world is looking at 
uh, legislation in relation to cyber security. The European Union has set up a, a, a very strict regime for cyber security. So even if you don't have an office in anywhere in part of the European Union, if you sell product into there, you're still covered by that legislation. Fines are well over a million dollars. Doesn't I don't care how big or small the company is. In the United States, for example, their if you like the equivalent of their local councils, they have legislation. Their states have other legislation. The Commonwealth or the the um, the United States federal government that has legislation. Then you have to consider um, the overseas jurisdictions and what legislation they have. And they're all running fast as they can to protect their citizens by legislation. So you need to know yep. where you operate and how that operates. And the thir third thing, and I guess for startups is really important, is the reputational risk. The reputational risk can kill you. And people don't have faith in your business. That's why you have to have operationally security to protect your reputation risk. But you also have to have a plan. If you're a startup, it's probably not so important. If you're getting into the point where you're starting to make some money out of it, you really need to look at putting in place, if you like, a business plan for cyber security, which, does, which outlines the policies and procedures that you have in place to deal with an incident. If you do get hacked, who do you call? What do you do? Mm. You know, you need to know that in advance to minimise that risk. And that plan, uh, what's happened over the last couple of years, particularly um, last year, a lot of companies came out with cyber insurance policies. The insurance companies have been absolutely slammed this year with claims worldwide. And so they're looking a lot harder at companies. I can envisage a future where if you don't have systems, policies and procedures in place to mitigate your risk of having a cyber breach, you won't be able to get cyber insurance. Mm -hmm. If you don't have that, even if you're a startup or a small business, you're dead in the water. Yeah, right. You are so exposed. And um, obviously we have police to protect us from general theft. Is there a decent sized police force allocated to this this not for crime. not for business. We basically um, up to your business up, up, to do your own. Up to your own. The, the, the government is working on that. I know, but right now it's it's up to us. And and if it does happen, we'll be at the to, at the top end and we'll filter down. But small to medium businesses, um, you're really on your own. You have to have good passwords. You've got to get an antivirus program. Um, a good antivirus program. Uh, I have a really great one. I won't mention any names because we're not about promoting brands, but there there are plenty out there. Get a paid one, not a free one, and make sure you one that does automatic up, uploads. That's really important, so you don't have to think about it because you'll forget, and that won't be done. So the the antivirus program for a small business absolutely important. And you need to get a cyber insurance policy. Some of them are, are pretty simple, but you need to read carefully what the policy says. In all honesty, when you, the whole thing about cyber security is really frightening because we're now moving into the era of uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence. And um, to be honest, I, I've, I've, uh, I've started watching Star Wars because uh, it's really interesting when you look at the technology in it, the special effects now, but, but they, they mirror what's, what's the direction that it's all going in, where you've got machines that will understand uh, in artificial intelligence terms, um, you know, we'll, we'll have consciousness. Mm -hmm. So cyber security, when I say it's, it's a whole new industry, and um, it's not going to go away because there's too much money involved for criminals. So you really need to um, look at these things and address them and have a plan for how you are going to combat them. And once again, if you ever look at selling your business, I can tell you that if you have had a breach, right now your enterprise value 
at the when you go to sell it is valued at somewhere between 1.8 and 15 percent less than it would be if you hadn't had a breach. Mm. Um, insurance companies are looking very closely to see whether you have that um, because all insurance companies policies say you have to make an effort to mitigate your breach so it's not a matter of uh, well I've got this so I'm home free because if you don't make any if, if they get too many claims they're in it to make money they want a company to have insurance who's got really good security just like with health insurance, they want to have young people who don't get sick. Um, so if you don't have any of those steps in there to mitigate the risk, you may not be able to get the insurance or even if you've got it and they can show that you didn't take reasonable steps to mitigate your risk, they can deny your claim. Well, it's no, no different to if you leave your house, the house open to attack, is, is it? Mm. No, it's, it's exactly the same. So well, you really need to take this seriously. I know it's overwhelming. Yeah, I know. we've had some really positive and uplifting uh, uh, podcasts, and this is not one of them. <laughs> no, but it is, it, well, I'm going to go and reevaluate every, re everything I do. <laughs> no, but, I, no I, but very, very yeah. valuable, very valuable, and you know, you can bury your head in the sand, and you can end up losing your business. Well, I think the best way to describe it is, I think for a lot of people at the moment, it only becomes a problem when it becomes a problem, and I think mm -hmm. if we can inform, we can reinforce the. Uh, the attitude hopefully that you've got to start looking at this now especially if you're wanting to start a business is to not leave it to the last minute just put it in your business plan start thinking about it now and actually start doing something take action Excellent. You, you can take action and look you don't need to buy all the tools and the things to help you to help you mitigate that risk there are some very simple easy steps that you can take and inexpensive steps for me starts with password protection sure and is this information on your website i mean obviously this is your 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 game so we'll put links to on the on the podcast on the facebook site to get to your your um site but is there links that people can use there that they can help themselves yeah, to sure. educate themselves about this issue well the the i guess the other thing i didn't mention is you're probably thinking about well we need to get our staff trained that's a very important component of it as well and we have an automatic system of staff training. We've got an introductory level and then ongoing training to make sure that the staff in the business and yourself keep up to date with things. So um, if you just uh, Google avantiacybersecurity.com.au, that'll give you the weekly reports, which are really overwhelming when you, when you read what's happening around the world, but it'll give you a bit of a flavor of, of the direction that it's all going in. Wow, no, I'll, I'll, I'll certainly provide a link to that uh, blog on the Off to Market Facebook page. So, uh, Paul, thank you very much. I think, uh, you know, really for company or sorry for individuals, entrepreneurs, inventors that are wanting to commercialise their product and idea, cybersecurity risk management underpins anything that you do in your venture. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. You've been listening to Off to Market with Scott Farley and Hamish Chadwick. 